Every Good Friday, in the Philippines, there are young men who remember Christ's death in a dramatic way. They have themselves crucified. In Britain today, there are believers who also display the wounds of Christ. But these are not made by nails. I was on the cross with Christ. There was no pain at all. I was breathing, and yet I, I was out of my body and that I was weightless, just feeling absolutely calm, content, a serenity, just so peaceful. Last year on Good Friday, the marks of the crucifixion appeared spontaneously on the body of Heather Woods. This man appeared and he said, I have these holes, these marks. My first reaction was one of, of amazement and uh, wonder and awe. George Hamilton has had the marks of the crucifixion, the stigmata, on his body for eight years. And Irish stigmatic Christina Gallagher says a vision has shown her that God will punish the world before the year 2000. There's only a short period of time before a chastisement will come upon the world. And those who will drift back into sin again, when the chastisement will come, it will cleanse the earth of all sin, and those who rebel against God will be totally wiped out. The stigmata are the wounds of Christ's crucifixion. Marks on hands and feet as if nails have been driven in. A wound in the side and the scars of a crown of thorns. A stigmatic is someone who physically receives these wounds on his or her body. There have only been 300 genuine cases in history. St. Francis of Assisi was the first undisputed case. The most famous in this century is the Italian monk, Padre Pio. There have been many more women than men. And unexpectedly in this scientific age, there are probably more people alive with the marks now than ever before. Are we witnessing a wave of modern miracles? Is it just a collection of clever frauds? Or is there some other explanation as to why a medieval mystery should have survived to challenge all common sense and logic? It used to be quite an active life. I used to hill walk. I used to go for a, a pint at one time. Oh, well, that's all finished now. George Hamilton lives on an estate in the outskirts of Glasgow. He's a devout Roman Catholic and like many stigmatics before him, is unable to eat. He survives from a drip feed through his nose. I met George first, I think, about seven years ago, when I was auxiliary bishop in Glasgow, and I remember it was an evening when I was confirming a number of children. And while I was talking to the children, and a Miss Mann appeared, and he said, I have these holes, in the, or these marks in my hands. My first reaction was one of, of amazement and uh, Wonder and awe. What he did was he took his gloves off and showed me his hands. They weren't covered, there were no bandages on. He had these marks in his hand. He'd just take these gloves off, and that was the first time I'd seen these things at all. I'd been looking for something unusual about George for some time. Uh, having known him for some years before, I always felt there's been something missing uh, from his story, but uh, this is something unusual. Not too bad. Right, what can we do you for the day? Uh, your prescription. Right. Can you, can you take it off? Do you want me to take it off? Huh? And you go. You tear my hair there. Oh gosh. Right. It's still running. Yeah. It's still running. That's worse than the first time, eh? Uh -huh. Still going on. Any other? Spots come up. I know the other hand, but has there any been any other points since I saw you? Uh, this is a bit in the sides. Right. Don't think I really showed you that. No, before. I haven't seen that before. He has told me on more than one occasion that he really doesn't want this. He would quite like it to go away. So I don't see someone perpetuating this problem 
um, when, when he's told me that he really sometimes wishes it just goes away because there's too much hassle attached to it. Well, before uh, they actually st uh, started uh, bleeding, I always did have pain in my hands and my feet and various parts of my body. I always put it down to me, the, the work I was doing. So one uh, afternoon I was working in the, the living room and I felt a sharp uh, thrust of pain up my right arm and then my left. I never really gave it much thought, so it was awful sore. And I forgot about it until the next morning I woke up and... There was blood? All over the hands? And pain? Is it something that you wish had never happened to you? Sometimes you think it's a... Uh, it seems to be more of a curse than a blessing. More of a curse. Most, but not all, stigmatics are Roman Catholic. And the Roman Catholic Church tends to adopt a cautious approach. It was the first time I'd ever encountered anything like this. And yet I was impressed with George. Uh, I wanted him to know that, that uh, I believed what he was saying to me. And I wanted him to know also that I was listening to him and I wasn't making any quick judgments. What has been the reaction of the church to your experience? Very quiet. Yeah, very, they don't say much. They say, wait and see. You believed what he was saying to you, but does, is that the same thing as it was genuine from God? It's not really saying the same thing. Uh, all, all it is saying is that I wanted George to, to feel that uh, the church, uh, the official church, maybe that's why he came to me as a bishop, uh, was saying to him, I want to hear what you think about it. In fact, I said to him, George, what do you think is happening here? And he said, I, I really don't know. And of course, I had to say, I really don't know either. Ireland's Atlantic coast, the remote island of Achill has become a centre for pilgrims of the Catholic faith. They travel to the House of Prayer on Achill Sound for spiritual retreat from everyday life. They are drawn by the presence of an Irish housewife who claims she has experienced the suffering of Christ. The Lord is with thee. Well, I began to receive pain or get pain in my hands, in my wrists and in my head it was not a headache, it was like as if a piercing, as if there was a hole, an existing hole there and you could feel an instrument or something go through my head. And as time went on, the pain developed to marks. It would be red patches in my wrists and the pain continues, the pain is much greater when there is no marks. She was completely out of herself and she's suffering this intense suffering and she talking about, oh, the crown of thorns, oh, the crown of thorns. And she put her hands up to her head and tried to take the thorns out, you know. In fact, it was gradually getting worse, and I felt as if I was nearly um, gone unconscious, nearly to the point I felt I was dying. And then I wasn't aware of an awful lot more, only seeing flashes of the face of Jesus. And at that point, I truly was begging him to take away the pain because I didn't think I could cope. I, was, I, I felt I was dying through the pain. Some people might say you're describing symptoms of severe migraines or depression or hallucination. Um, well, I've had migraine and um, when you go through those experiences, you feel the thorn go directly through my head. It's not a question of a migraine. I know what headaches are, or a migraine is, and it's nothing like that. Although Christina currently displays no outward sign of the stigmata, she says she is in pain all the same. Do you feel pain at the moment? A little. Where? In my head. And your wrists? No. 
do you feel pain most of the time? Um, roughly about 90% of the time. One characteristic of the stigmata is that wounds tend to open and bleed the most at the holiest times of the church's calendar. Heather Woods is a deacon in the small Holy Celtic Church in Lincoln. As she assisted her bishop at the Good Friday service last year, her wounds were clearly visible. By his wounds we have been healed. But you are he that took me out of the Heather's stigmata had first appeared a year earlier in 1992. They first appeared, it was um, Bank Holiday Monday, May the 3rd. And it just started as a little blister. And you know if you do painting or you're writing for a long time. And I just noticed it and I thought, oh, I wonder, wonder what I've done to get that. And I showed my friend and thought nothing more of it. But then the next day, another blister appeared here. And within two days, a blister was on, on the tops of my hands. And these had started to weep. So um, Father Eric uh, is my priest and a very dear friend. Um, I showed them to him, we went to see him and he obviously recognised it and told me what he thought it was, the stigmata, and he explained that. And I said, oh dear, what, what's going to happen? You know, why, why me? I suppose the question we always ask. Well, when you first saw the marks in Heather's hands, did you know what was happening to her? Yes, I'd already forewarned her that I thought she might have. Uh, she had this funny sensation in the palms of the hands, and I said to her before I went off to France, don't be at all surprised that you don't get the stigmata. Strange as it may seem, and it uh, was exactly exactly what happened, yes. It's quite raw. It's a dark pinky colour. The skin is broken underneath, but it, it doesn't look normally as if it would bleed, but it does actually weep. It just comes up through the skin all the wounds do, and I have found that when I wash them all over, it just continues to bleed. On two occasions, Heather also developed a cross on her forehead. Her GP, Dr. S.K. Banger, examined the wounds and was sufficiently convinced to write this open letter. I believe that these were spontaneous lesions of hands, feet and side, and can offer no medical explanation for their appearance. But frauds do occur. In the Italian village of Capodrise near Naples, a crowd recently gathered to pray for a young self-styled visionary and stigmatic known as Virginia Improta. The crowd's prayers were intense, as Virginia had told them that a vision had predicted her imminent death. Her claims were investigated and ultimately dismissed by Milan doctor and psychotherapist Marco Magnelli. We received uh, a, a lot of pictures showing uh, on this uh, girl, Virginia, uh, a lot of stigmatic phenomena that were probably very interesting if true. Videotapes sent to Dr. Magnelli show the burgeoning cult that Improta was starting to generate, and apparently dramatic examples of the stigmata. However, when Improta came to Milan for a medical examination, Dr. Magnelli was in for surprise. She was dressed as a girl, but she was a man. We performed a, an X-ray examination of the chest, demonstrating that she bear artificial breasts and we uh, perform some mm, hormonal test uh, demonstrating that she had a, a very big amount of testosterone, that's the uh, male chief uh, uh, hormone. Virginia, in reality Michele Improta, claimed to have had wounds almost constantly for five years. Dr. Magnelli's team found no evidence of this and psychological tests, including hypnosis, revealed him as a fraud. We asked uh, many times uh, this man to come back and show us uh, the, the phenomena when th they uh, appear or they produce, and no uh, answer from him. He says uh, to be able to perform miracles. A lot of people go looking at uh, him, and he pray like a priest. 
but I think he is a liar. He is not a true stigmatized man. Improta did not die on the predicted day. He claimed this was a result of the prayers of the faithful. Since then, interest in him amongst Italians has waned, and he's disappeared. Yes, there have been uh, a few cases in, in our own time of, of frauds where people have been discovered sort of actually working up uh, the marks uh, and so on. But really, these are comparatively rare. I think you can look back through the, the generality of stigmatics, um, many of whom have been very, very closely scrutinized in their time because you know, these were quite extraordinary things happening. The 19th century, a great deal of, um, of scientific work was done. You know, one stigmatic had her arm sort of encased in a special um, glass case so that she could not get at, the, um, uh, at her wrist or her hands at all to actually tweak up the, the marks, as it were. And yet the marks would, would, would still appear. Could George have made these marks deliberately? That's always a possibility in a thing like this, yes. Um, I've known him for a long time now. Um, I don't think that someone would do this in such a way, in such a repeated way, it would be quite difficult. But it certainly is possible you could do it yourself. But in knowing George, do you believe he's telling you the truth? In knowing George and spent time not only in the surgery with George, but even took take him out for a coffee outside the surgery context and got to know him quite a bit. Yes, I think I, I don't see George as doing this to himself at all. I think we can be reasonably assured that there is a very definite phenomenon happening here. So while there are going to be the occasional case of fraud, I don't think we need to worry about them too much. But how can one be sure, you know, the outsider, that you haven't made marks yourself? How can I be sure? Well, how can anybody seeing you be sure? Oh, well, there's nowhere they can be sure. You just have to take my word for it, and I've got to rely on God that the government is trying to, to carry on. There are countless medieval stories of stigmatics performing miracles. Tales of healing the sick, surviving for years without food, heavenly visions and other supernatural events. Hundreds of years later, they cannot be verified and are generally viewed with skepticism. Yet today, stigmatics claim that similar things are happening to them before the unbelieving eyes of the modern world. When Heather Woods first received the stigmata, she began visionary drawings and writings over which she apparently had no control. The writings are all the time. I always have an hour in prayer with the Lord in the morning and at least two hours at night. It's my own space, my own time. Prolific, really, just writing, 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 but with my left hand, and I'm right-handed, so, and the writing isn't mine. In varying styles of handwriting and prose, a wide range of mystical themes is covered. I don't understand a lot of it. It's way above me and Father explains it sentence by sentence. And then I can see a little bit and I go, oh, yes. What I can see, and I've looked at them constantly, is that there is an exciting happening, I feel, to take place in the near future. And um, that all of us, and some of us, perhaps are going to be set aside for a reason. But what the reason will eventually be, we will eventually be told. I was given a drawing, again, which I, I drew with my left hand, and I've been told by people who've witnessed it. And it was of Christ on the cross, but, but not on a cross. He was on a post with his hands like this. And I was, I was quite upset because it was only after I'd seen it that I, I felt all the pain of the whole world, really. It began in December. Tears coming from religious statues when assistant pastor James Bruce was in the room or touched the objects. Then in January, he discovered small wounds on his wrist, his feet, and his right side. Lake Ridge, Virginia, USA. When Father Jim Bruce developed the stigmata in 1992, newspaper and television reporters went wild. I know it's got to be some kind of special gift but I don't know exactly what it means. It has no meaning or significance, but I can put my hands on it. But his stigmata were not the major attraction. 
the main statue in the church cried uh, profusely. Uh, and then it did it again at 12.30. And then it did it again at the Ash Wednesday services on Wednesday night and again on Thursday. We saw tears coming down the face to here and also some on the chin. These pictures of a statue of the Virgin Mary were shot by an American television news crew. In the presence of Father Bruce and the news crew, and apparently without any tampering, it is shedding tears. The church has always been very um, cautious about such claims, partly because we want to know if there is a scientific explanation, you know, whether it's to do with humidity or something of that sort, that statues are weeping. Um, and also to ask the question that must always be there, which is, what is the purpose of this? If, this is, if God is doing this, why? I don't think fraud is impossible, and I don't think the bits of the church, uh, echelons of the church, that wouldn't uh, use a device like this, though I think the mainstream command of the church is uh, much more reputable than that. No conclusive explanation has emerged. Meanwhile, congregations of the church have soared. In the course of history, there have been many stories of saints with the stigmata who survived on nothing but communion wafers. Today, in Glasgow, George Hamilton claims a similar experience. You also have, at the moment, uh, the tube on your nose, through yeah. your nose. Why, why is that? Can't take swords. You just can't eat? Can't eat, no. I've, tr I've tried to eat, uh, but generally end up uh, being sicker. I've fallen asleep for, for hours and end. It's very worrying that he is not taking any f actual solid food. Um, he's now maintained on this pump and artificial feeding. And uh, I'm on a, f a food machine. It's a, a liquid nutrition diet. It just keeps me ticking over. That cannot be a complete diet. Uh, at some point in time, it's going to, to go down. Um, he continues to lose weight. Many stigmatics have claimed to enter states described as religious ecstasies. Through deep prayer, the individual passes into a kind of trance. It's during ecstasies like this that Christina Gallagher claims she has seen dozens of three-dimensional apparitions of Jesus, Mary, heaven, and hell. Um, hell is something that's very terrifying. Um, it's like a sea of fire with bodies um, swimming as if in a sea, different levels, all black. And the horror I experienced during seeing this, as Jesus was with me when I had seen this, and he said, um, my daughter, this is the abyss of hell for all those who do not love my father. Christina also claims that during these religious ecstasies, she is given prophecies of the future. There's only a short period of time before a chastisement will come upon the world. Now, people will scoff at um, a chastisement as they will scoff at the experience I've been through, but um, I would pray to the Lord and offer my life a hundred times if I could that people would not for the welfare of their own soul. Because if they knew, as much as I know, after seeing hell, they would certainly not um, gamble with such a risk. And those who will drift back into sin again, when the chastisement will come, it will cleanse the earth of all sin, and those who rebel against God will be totally wiped out. And from what is given to me, I understand we will well and truly be there by the year 2000 if we're not through it by the year 2000. Hundreds of years ago, religious fervor was so great that experiences like this would have been called miracles. Today, many people look for the rational explanation. Heather's writings could be the work of her subconscious mind. George's inability to eat, a psychosomatic reaction to stress, the statue's tears could be condensation, and Christina's visions, hallucinations. 
and yet, large pockets of religious fervor still exist. Devotees of Padre Pio, this century's best-known stigmatic, claim that during his life, this simple Italian monk performed many miracles, most notably hundreds of instances of healing the sick. They also claim that although he's been dead 25 years, his healing powers still exist. Last November, his followers filled Liverpool's Roman Catholic Cathedral and heard the story of Alice Jones. Immobilized for seven years by a severely damaged spine, she claimed she was cured by a vision of Padre Pio while a faith healer laid his hands on her. He knelt by my side and eventually I undid the caliper at the top of my left leg. My leg was three and a half inches wasted and it was also two inches shorter than my other leg. And suddenly there was a pain, a very severe pain, and my leg began to grow and I cried out, Father, stop. And as I looked down, there in front of his face was the face of an old man with a beard and eventually the old man took me by my arm and in a loud voice said arise in the name of Jesus and walk and I did. I think doctors recognize that there is a very large um, element of will in people's cure. The invocation of faith and the additional source of faith provided by a stigmatic um, obviously give a huge psychological charge to another believer or someone sympathetic to believe. I'm sure that it's possible and um, even medical evidence would point towards some inexplicable healings. Um, but if, if God does heal, I think it's always for a purpose and, um, and not simply as a, as a party trick. Alice Jones claims that medical examinations since her recovery show her spine to be still wasted and damaged beyond surgical repair. She says that medically it should be impossible for her to walk. And after hearing her testimony, dozens of the faithful queue to receive a blessing from one of the mittens Padre Pio wore to cover his wounds. Some merely hope to acquire grace. Others are looking to be healed by items of his clothing. I think this is something which happens when anybody is holy. People want to touch something of him or of her. They want to be close to him or to her. So I think a cult develops with the holy person. But certainly, we're, well, perhaps happily, we're all very human, and so we can overdo this sense. For over 50 years, Padre Pio lived in the south Italian town of San Giovanni Rotondo. A thriving tourist industry has grown around his memory to cater for the thousands of pilgrims who visit each year. The power of his name raised enough money to build one of Italy's finest hospitals in the town. And the cell where he lived and died has been preserved and turned into a museum. This is the room where Father Pio spent the last 20 years of his life. Here's the desk upon which are linens which covered the wound in his heart, socks, gloves, the chips of the crusted blood that would fall from the hands when he take off these gloves. Note the sandals in the case Note how swollen the feet were from the Passion of Christ. The bed, everything preserved in plastic because the snippers are at it and everyone wants to take home a souvenir. A sink is below the window from which he would wave and bless the people come round the back of the friary. Undoubtedly, Padre Pio was a good priest and a holy man. 
but it's his stigmata and his supposed ability to perform miracles that have ensured his lasting fame. With Padre Pio, you would also get other stories um, of amazing telepathy, um, people seeing him in a 200 miles away from where he actually was at any one time. Uh, some of these stories, I think, one has to take with um, a fair pinch uh, of salt. During his lifetime, word of the monk who performed miracles spread worldwide. In his later years, he only ever said mass at 5 a.m. Yet it was still packed with pilgrims wanting to see him in the flesh and hoping to witness a miracle. I witnessed a non-miracle, as far as I was concerned, when I was serving mass. And uh, we knelt, of course, behind him during mass. And then we went up um, afterwards, uh, after communion and so on. And I had to help him to purify the chalice. When I went up to the cleansing of the chalice, the host was in the bottom of the chalice. And he just moved it with his finger and then consumed it. And when I came out from the church, everybody, a miracle, a miracle. So I said, Miracle, miracle. I said, what, what? They said, the host was there, then he was gone. So I said, what do you mean? Well, it was there, then it was gone. So I said, but it was in the, the base of the chalice. No, 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 miracle, it's gone. I think it's a form of, which is constant in many forms of religion and not only Christianity. People fix on a particular thing, which might be good in a context, and fix on it in a superstitious way, as if somehow by getting the blood of the wounds, they were part of what the blood of Christ does, which of course is not to multiply wounds and so on, but to show that there is a chance of overcoming sin, overcoming suffering, overcoming death. Well, I have part of his stigmata on round my neck. It's a, a scab from his hand, because as he said mass, they took off the mittens and the scabs that were formed on the back of his hand would fall on the altar cloth and of course they saved them. And so after I'd worked for about 11 years, I think the vice postulator of the cause of Padre Pio gave me this scab from his hand, which is very precious. What do you make of the people who want to have the bandages from a stigmatist or have a relic from one? I'm afraid I think they're sick. Some people might think it's very odd to have a scab of somebody around your neck. Well, it is, but of course it is. it will be a first-class relic when he is beatified. It's certainly something very precious to me. A night out in Cambridge where a young man under hypnosis thinks he is Elvis Presley. The power of the hypnotist to deceive the conscious mind of his subjects makes good entertainment. It makes them feel very relaxed, very comfortable. Being into hypnosis is very, very pleasant. All we do is get them to relax, basically. Let their inhibitions go. Let their imaginations run riot. <laughs> That's the way. Milk your cows there. In time to the music. Once again, you're on your desert. Ashley Dean is convinced that the kind of tricks being played by the mind here can explain how stigmatics develop the wounds of Christ. Oxford are doing very well. Oxford it's known as a fact that you can, under hypnosis, induce various physical items. If I was to, uh, knowing that you perhaps suffer from uh, an allergy to wool, to, under hypnosis to tell you that I'm rubbing wool on your skin, if you believe it, you will, in fact, get an allergy rash in the place where the wall was rubbed. So how does that apply to, to stigmata, would you say? If uh, I was to place a coin in your hand while you're under hypnosis and tell you it was red hot, you would be likely then to get a, a burn mark on the hand where the coin has been. Stigmata has been produced under hypnosis. In the 1930s, there was a German called Leckler, Dr. Leckler, who had a psychiatric patient come under his care and he hypnotized her. And he asked her to relive in her mind the sufferings of Jesus, the passion leading up to the crucifixion, the crucifixion itself. In the course of, of mentally reliving these experiences, she literally began to 
bleed, and then blood began to come from her hands, and actual holes appeared uh, in her hands, and her feet. And to me, it is the most demonstrative case of something of what um, is happening with stigmata. But hypnotism is not the only trance-like state in which the unexpected can happen. Heather Wood's marks had almost gone when she fell into a religious ecstasy. During this trance, she experienced a particularly vivid vision. I reached out and held his hands, and as I went to hold his hands, I believed that to be our Lord. And it's as I touched his hand, I found myself on the cross. And I was just looking down. I was on the cross with Christ. There was no pain. I was breathing. And yet I, I was out of my body in that I was weightless. Just feeling absolutely calm, content, a serenity, just so peaceful. I thought, oh, this is it. This is heaven. I have died and this is heaven. It's true. No more tears, no more pain, and, and a lot of love. And then, the next minute, I'm, I'm here again, sitting in the chair, and I'm cold, and it's only when I go, Whoa, that the water's dripping from my head, and that makes me look down at my hands, and they're pouring with blood. Over hundreds of years, stigmatics like Heather have shown this same pattern a trance-like ecstatic state followed by the appearance of the stigmata. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, ecstasy or an altered state of consciousness is the, the, the way or the, the door to go into another possibility of using brain. All people have in his mind or in his brain this possibility, the mechanism is inside our brain, but they are able to use in a way that other people don't. The stigmatics themselves remain convinced that what is happening to them is the work of God. It's maybe to help someone else. I don't, I'm not really sure, so I can't explain it. They come from God, do you think? I just come from God, yeah. Roughly half of the recorded cases of stigmata display the side wound on the left-hand side and half on the right. The Bible doesn't specify which is correct, and there are other inconsistencies. Until fairly recent cases, invariably the marks have appeared in the center of the palms of the hands. Now, no historian of that time, I believe, thinks that that was the way the commonest form of Roman execution was carried out. The body, which was commonly on the cross a good deal longer than the three hours historically attributed to Jesus, would tear through so flimsily attached uh, a fixture. It would rip through the knuckle, and it is believed that the standard method was through the wrist. In Father Jim Bruce's church in Lake Ridge, Virginia, this crucifix unusually has nails through the wrists, and it is on the wrists that he received his marks. Could this mean that stigmatics reproduce on their bodies the wounds of a painting or crucifix familiar to them? One pointer is that in the first 1,200 years of Christianity, when religious art depicted Jesus shedding no blood and suffering no pain, there are no recorded stigmatics. In the 13th century, dictated by a theological change that happened at that time, he was suddenly depicted really suffering, blood coming uh, from his hands and his feet and so on. And this seems to have sparked in ordinary people an empathy, um, an intensity of wanting to share in that suffering. And so you have people who in fact took this, this image of suffering which they saw in art upon themselves. But in the late 20th century, the idea of wanting to suffer physically for God is unacceptable for many. I think it would be improper for anyone to want to share in the sufferings of Christ in that physical and direct way. It, uh, it's much more a question of joining in with what the sufferings of Christ point to and lead into, which is therefore discipleship, 
boldness to suffer, readiness to persevere and so on, and to tie it down to physicalities, I suspect, would be something verging on a superstitious mistake. But even today, there are people who have themselves literally crucified every Good Friday as a sign of penance for their community. This ritual in the Philippines is an extreme manifestation of a part of the Christian faith which is all about suffering, and which focuses on Christ's crucifixion as a sacrifice intended to redeem the world's sins. I never realized why I would be called upon to suffer so much. Was this a punishment or what was happening to me? So then when I questioned this, one day Jesus said about giving him a drink of water. And I said, yes, but how do you give the Lord a drink of water? You know, I didn't know. And then he said, you are like a grape that is ripe. When you are crushed, you give me a drink. I do not thirst for water or wine. I thirst for souls. So it gave me an understanding through being crushed and the suffering, what Jesus was actually doing. He was saving souls. While some Christians might wish to enter Christ's suffering in this physical way, most stigmatics maintain they don't want the wounds. Consciously, perhaps, they didn't want them to appear. Unconsciously, they could have done quite easily. Our unconscious mind is very, very strong indeed even perhaps stronger than our conscious mind, because it governs our conscious mind. The psychological framework wherein someone's unconscious mind might want to wish wounds upon themselves is one thing, but that doesn't explain how the marks actually appear on the skin of a particular few. But that stuff that we gave you the last time you felt the medical profession is not able to offer an all-embracing explanation, but it does accept that it is possible for the mind to change the body. At the University Hospitals of Cleveland, Ohio, study has been carried out into a medical phenomenon called psychogenic purpura. The patient, often a young woman, begins to experience painful bruising, uh, mostly on the extremities, but it can be on the uh, trunk, uh, on the neck, very rarely on the face, and usually not on the back ever. What's unusual about these bruises is that they've not been caused by physical contact. They are rather the outward signs of an inner trauma appearing on the bodies of patients experiencing severe stress. I've had one patient who's hand had been amputated and he then developed bruising uh, on the body starting with that arm and then spreading to the rest of the body. The idea of psychogenic purpura, the reproduction of um, wounds, injuries on the body seems perfectly to meet the point that I am making which is that um, suffering, wish, belief, Personal preoccupation uh, can have physical manifestation. A gulf still remains between the appearance of general bruising and specific wounds. Yet the case of a psychiatric patient reported in the medical journal The Lancet in 1946 tells of a dramatic and specific example of the mind's power. This young man was seemingly reliving a time back ten years before in which he had been bound up as a psychiatric patient, when people were less liberal, his arms had been burned. And the ropes from that binding were reappearing in the course of his mentally reliving that experience 10 years later. It was effectively um, a, a form of stigmata, which was actually happening before um, the, the psychiatrist's eyes. Yet can it be possible for the mind to produce marks relating not to an individual's direct experience, but to an execution 2,000 years ago? Dr. Marco Magnelli says he has seen it happen. Okay, in this movie, <clears throat> we are observing the uh, phenomenology of Domenica Lobianco during the Holy Week of two years ago. Here you can see the, the date. 
Every Easter, in Briatico in the south of Italy, Domenica Lobianco produces these peculiar stigmata, even more specific than the usual nail marks. She says they represent the rosary and the stars. In the Good Friday, she has such a wound, namely a cross, some mark, and uh, two big circles on the left uh, arm. In the next day, Saturday, the appearance of the wand is this. So they are vanishing. And uh, by the fact, uh, one week later, we observe only a discoloration of the skin. One year later, the skin is perfect because we went uh, at the home of these uh, women just one year after these pictures. Dr. Marnelli's team carried out psychological tests on Domenica Lobianco. During questioning, she became emotional and agitated. Then, through hypnosis, she entered a trance-like state, and her skin began to change. The most important uh, happening during our tests or examination was that from a normal skin, the stigmata become visible. From the start, when her skin was clear, through to the moment when the signs of the wounds also emerged, was this woman under your constant observation? Absolutely. We were five people, and we videotaped all the, the inquiry, and she was all the time with us. So I think that this is a very strong and important uh, uh, scientific uh, result. While this may show how the mechanism producing stigmata works, a religious believer might say that God created the mechanism anyway. A rationalist might be more interested in how the mind's power to make wounds could be used for the purposes of healing. And yet, whatever advances in understanding have been made, many of the stigmata's mysteries remain unsolved, and the sway held by stigmatics over the faithful is powerful. In Ireland, the cult surrounding Christina Gallagher, while still small in comparison with that of Padre Pio, continues to grow. Filipino politician Cory Aquino and Mother Teresa of Calcutta number among her thousands of supporters worldwide. Well, our Blessed Mother requested a house of prayer and she led me here because at a later time, in the time of chastisement, this house will be protected. Nothing will be touched. It will be totally protected through the power of God. We don't quite understand how they happen, but they have nothing to do with God. They have to do with some relationship between our, uh, our mental processes and our physical body. George Hamilton's marks continue to bleed. He is still unable to eat. Sometimes people want the miraculous to happen. Sometimes it's suggested to them and then they take it on board and sometimes it becomes a sort of hysterical reaction. Um, sometimes that explanation won't do. It's an outward, visible sign that miracles are not a thing of the past, they still do happen. It's showing that Jesus is moving among us and in our midst. Since this program was filmed, both Bishop Eric Eads and Heather Woods have died. I feel very tired. I'm drained of all my energy and my body, as it were, wrecked in pain. pain and as Easter approached, Christina Gallagher again started to display physical evidence of the pain she describes. <laughs>